Hey everyone, my name is Christian. I'm a white male non-disabled dancer and teacher at Stopgap. My hair is nice and short and I smile a lot. And today I'm here to give you an introduction to teaching dance skills in an inclusive way. What are dance skills? It's all about understanding how movement works and you bring all of that understanding into the body. Why is it useful? For a number of reasons. It's really important for dancers to build a personal movement skills base that they can use as a springboard to improvise. It's about dancers finding their own different versions for certain dance skills such as turning, jumping and rolling. And they can regularly practice these skills so they can feel and notice themselves improve. And there are so many different examples of these dance skills exercises. It could be about finding movements in the hands and the feet in an articulation, finding texture in a fold and float, and exploring surfaces in surface work, and that's just to name a few of them. But arguably the most important thing is that it can ignite that creativity. Now, how are you gonna set this up in your session? So you could ask your dancers to find a space facing you, and you could use colored cards so they know where they are in the space. You could also use music that reflects the qualities of your exercise as well. You could use open language when you teach your exercise. What's open language? Open language is about using descriptive words so that it really informs the dynamics and the qualities of the movement that you're going for. I'm gonna give you an example side by side so you can have a look at the difference. We've got extend the arm forwards or extend your limb long into space. So they're very different. I'm going to give you another example. Find folds and floats throughout the whole of your body. And this now leads me on to talk about the dance skills exercise that we're going to be looking at today. I think you've probably guessed it by now. It's the fold and float. So the fold and float, it's an exercise all about dancing together. It's about finding folds and floats throughout the whole of the body, possibly leading into a balance. It can be really beneficial for everyone to find a nice, easy, calm breath before you begin the exercise. So now I'm just gonna give you some movement examples that you may want to put in to your fold and float exercise. It could be about pressing through the balls of the feet into a rise, pressing your hands into the side of your chair to get some air underneath the sit bones. It could be about shifting your weight to one side into a balance. It could be about shifting your body off your center in any direction. It's all about finding a sense of float throughout the whole of the body and perhaps an element of softness in there as well. The same can be said for folds. Folds in the knees, elbows, neck, fingers, spine, anywhere in the body that you can find a fold. So we're now going to take a little look at an example of a sequence to show you how you might want to put these movements together. Let's have a look at it. I find a soft fold in my knees, my arms float up. I find another soft fold in my knees, and my arms reach all the way up above my head. My fingertips fold and lead down to my sides. I press through the balls of my feet into a rise. I glide to one side into a balance. I glide to the other side into a balance. I bring my foot down into a neutral position. If you want more ideas, take a look at StopGap's replay channel. So, you've got your exercise. What happens now? You can give your dancers the opportunity to explore and improvise with the ideas of fold and float. This is a great opportunity to use open language to really influence, encourage and inspire your dancers' movement and also to find loads more movement possibilities. From this place, you've got your exercise, you've got your explorations, what progressions can we do? Changing of the facing, 
any direction, changing of the speed, or even changing the base. Wide base, narrow base, maybe even an uneven base. So now we're going to look at three top tips for supporting a dancer who may need one-to-one -one support. The first one is to use a prop to demonstrate. It could be a feather. Float, float, float. It could be a piece of paper. Fold, fold, fold. Anything that shows the quality of the exercise that you're looking for. And this can be particularly useful if you're working with a dancer who perhaps works more predominantly in a sensory way. The second one is to create a dialogue between yourself and your dancer so you can really discover what is the best option for them. The third and final one is to tailor the explorations that you do to your dancer's version of the sequence so that they can both help each other so that the dancer can then find loads more movement possibilities. So they were three top tips for supporting a dancer who may need one-to-one -one support. So we're now gonna look at how you can bring the fold and float exercise into your sessions. You could give four dancers the opportunity to lead the sequence on each side of the space. The dancer leading on the first side of the space finds their position, they breathe in, they breathe out, which allows everyone to find their timing and then they move through the sequence and everyone follows them. When they finish the sequence, the whole group moves through improvisation and exploration. They then wait for the dancer leading the second side of the space to find their position. They breathe in, they breathe out, and then they move through the sequence and then the whole cycle repeats as you travel around the whole of the space. This is a really great way to give a sense of journey and a sense of adventure in your sessions, but really importantly, it empowers the dancers to lead the group. Now, I'd just like to finish with four top tips for leading dance skills in an inclusive way in your sessions. The first one is to be as clear as possible in your body when you're teaching, because your dancers are gonna use you as inspiration and a reference as they learn. The second one is to always outline the objective and the intention of your exercise so that your dancers always know what they're aiming for. The third one is to at all times encourage individuality and different versions. And the fourth and final one is to use that open language. Now that's language that is descriptive of the dynamics and the qualities of the movement that are in your exercise. So this has been an introduction to dance skills. We looked at our fold and float exercise, how we can bring it into our session, and there were loads of top tips in there to help. Stay tuned, because next up, we're gonna be chatting with Nadan about traveling. Any questions at all that you have, please post them below, and Stop Gap are gonna be there to answer as best we can. Thanks so much, everyone.